All right. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Uh, there are quite a lot of people who are still waiting for the food outside. And they're not going to come. Um, please welcome Antti from Finland, um, our comrade and friend for many years. Uh, the talk is going to be like, he's going to be talking about the whole thing. I'm not going to introduce you to Finland or anything. Uh, just wanted to tell you that Anarchist Days uh, this year still needs donations. So if you feel like you have a bunch of euros in your pocket that are too heavy, uh, you can just drop it in the donation box that stands outside. Uh, we are also eager for people who are like helping things uh, to, to make things happen. Also, um, as this year, as usual, we are doing the things together with the uh, Chaos Computer Club. They also need a lot of people who are helping and who are making the event happening. Um, so feel free not just to consume and enjoy, but rather like get involved and you know DIY or die stuff. Um, yeah, and from my side, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, tomorrow we have full day of program. The day after tomorrow as well, food presentations and stuff. Um, but yeah, today is the last talk. Uh, not the last. There is another talk that's still happening, but still. Anti, you're up. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, my name is Anti. I'm going to talk. From about struggles against right-wing government in Finland, and I think it was idea to invite me because this might be a perspective at some point in Germany. But I have to, I have quite many slides, maybe too many. I tried to maybe have a talk of 40 or 50 minutes, and then there could might be some, hopefully, be some discussion. I also have a habit of talking a lot and too fast. Uh, so, if something is a bit unclear, feel free to stop me and ask, because otherwise maybe no one any more remembers what was the point. But yeah, I will start a bit about uh, just explaining a bit about the political system, because it's quite similar with the German system, but there are some differences, which are like quite small differences, which are having a big consequences. Uh, one obvious thing is that the president in Finland is having real power, but uh, it doesn't touch so much topic of this uh, presentation because it's more like foreign policy. Then there is just one chamber in parliament and there is no constitutional court. Constitutional matters are settled in the committee, in the parliament, which is actually means that the constitutional protections in Finland are quite weak traditionally which makes it uh, kind of kind of uh, it makes it vulnerable of some right wing attempts to to manipulate the system i think this is because finland was never dictatorships so there was not much of these protections were developed and this is creating some problems the voting system is quite similar with the german it's a proportional party system but it's an open list system so all the candidates inside the list are also competing with each other. And what it makes a difference is that there is no election threshold, but there is just a threshold is depending how many, how many members of parliament are elected from each uh, district. So in the biggest amount is 37 deputies, which makes a very small threshold. In the mainland there is the one district which is only, only Lapland, only elects six. And then in Holland Island, which is an autonomous region, they only have one candidate. But this means that there are more parties emerging. So about the party system, the difference is that there is no liberal party. There is a big uh, coalition party, right-wing coalition, which is originally it was a monarchist party. Now then it became sort of wide wide uh, coalition against socialism. It has both um, liberals and conservatives. It's, it's also party of the current prime minister. Then there is a strong agrarian party. It was actually, no, it, it's last six years it's called center party, but it's originally agrarian union. It currently has 23 seats out of 200, which is the worst results, I think, in the history. Then there is a party of the Swedish minority. It's the orientation is right-wing liberal, mostly or centrist uh, right-wing liberal. Nine plus one because usually the deputy from the Holland Islands is also in their group. Even through the Holland Island, they have their own party system. 
party system and um, they are uh, but because they have just one one member of parliament they are usually in the Swedish party group then there is also a small Christian fundamentalist party uh, representing the evangelical Christians which is currently also in the government and it's needed in the government to have the majority then there are some also like cultural or traditional differences how the party and election system works. There is more focus into integration instead of isolation. This goes both to direction traditionally in relation with the Communist Party, nowadays with uh, these uh, right-wing populists. And uh, also there is like lots of often unorthodox coalitions, so different left and right wing parties might be in the mixed, mixed uh, governments. Because in the general, the differences between political parties are not very big and uh, there is, especially in the foreign policy, there is not much of any disagreements. Like three years ago, all the parliamentary parties were against NATO membership. Now all the parliamentary parties, including the Green and Left Party, they are pro-NATO. So it's just like uh, everyone always has to have the same opinion. Left party was invited uh, to government oftentimes. It was in the, during the Cold War time, it was the, basically it was the Communist Party front organization, but um, communists never went to national elections as themselves. They always had uh, some sort of uh, front organizations. Originally they were mostly invited to government to it might be, for example, because Centre Party wanted to have a sort of rural coalition against the urban interests. Then lately they have been invited to the government because Social Democrats wants to have a protect to have a left party in the government with the Social Democrats not to, to lose the support to them. Also, there is was since the 80s they were often red-blue coalitions together with the Conservative coalition and the Social Democrats to counter the center party influence because otherwise the center party would basically always, because they are in kind of in the middle in the parliament, they would always be the balance, hang the balance of power. So in order to isolate them, there were coalitions between the, between the social democrats and the conservatives, but this might be history now because lately, they have, lately like last almost 10 years, they have been only block elections left-wing governments or right-wing governments. Then a bit about the right-wing populist party. I'm mostly talking with their uh, name in the Finnish, but also it because it doesn't really translate nicely. For some reason in the international media, they often, the official name is just the Finns, which is pretty stupid. And for obvious reasons, I would refuse to use this name. In the international press, they often, I don't actually don't know how they are called in the German press because I don't speak German, but in English speaking international press, it's usually called the True Finns, which is not really translation of the name. The more literal, literal translation would be maybe Average Finns or Base Finns, something like this. It's originally like uh, it's developed from party of the Finnish countryside. This was split from the center party in the 50s. Because Centre Party was always like very pragmatist, they understood that in the international trade, the Finnish uh, farming doesn't really much future. And uh, there was already in the 50s, there were a huge crisis in the countryside economy. So in the late 50s, there were almost 400,000 farms. Just when Finland was joining the EU, there were still almost 100,000 left. Nowadays, it's only like 40,000 left. So basically, like it's the most, most northern country in the mainland Europe. There is obviously not much to stand in the competition with, uh, with uh, Central European agriculture. And this was started to create a huge, like lots of the farms were basically not financially feasible. Peasants had to move to Sweden or the cities, and that this created lots of resentment, and this was basically the origins of, of this party. But now it has tried to reach more um, urban fund base. It was also the only party during the Cold War which was criticizing the Soviet Union, which obviously also resulted uh, some support for them, or only kind of major party. There were just some very small parties besides this. 
Also traditionally they are like anti-European Union. Now for obvious reasons they are not like talking anymore much about the European Union. It's more like this kind of modern populist anti-migrant and anti-environmentalist party. Uh, they have, have uh, actually the current the speaker of the parliament, which is also one of the specifics of the Finnish system. Like everything is kind of, there are some kind of traditions which parties don't want to give up. One of them, for example, government ministers, they are also, ministers are also chosen with this don't method. So each party is speaking the minister post. So basically, if there is two parties, big parties in the government, the first one has the prime minister, second has the minister of finance, third one has the foreign minister, and fourth one has uh, the minister of interior, which is the fourth most important thing, which means that uh, the second one has the fourth pick, which is the minister of interior, which is why Perus it is now having the minister of interior, and they actually, with this position, they also for them belongs kind of picking the, the leader of the secret service. So basically the right wing populists are now having the secret service in Finland, but this far, this, there has not been any like visible things happening. Only thing that we suspect that they might be leaking information about the Finnish Kurdish activists to the Turkish authorities. But this, uh, because there are some uh, pretty nasty things happening, have been happening in Turkey related to this, but we don't have a proof about this. It's obviously not quite easy to work with political agenda also in uh, kind of in this uh, secret services because not everyone there is supporting this populist party. But so the second biggest party is also picking the speaker of parliament, even if it happens to be the opposition party, but now the two biggest are in the government. So actually they have the speaker of parliament, the former chairperson of the party, Jussi Halla, who actually has also sentences of incitement of hatred against the minority groups and also the only member of European parliament has been sentenced on this. Obviously this party wants to decrease the sentences for this criminal statue. <laughs> for obvious reasons, they want smaller fines for themselves. Previous governments, this is maybe some extra slide. This was more like, don't go to this in detail. It was just an example that there has been also quite recently this kind of wide coalitions. Like for example, 2011, it was the first year that the right-wing populists got a big victory. So the coalition party gathered a huge coalition with uh, most, both with social democrats, greens, lefts, and Christian party and so on. This was called six pack. But yeah, this slide may, I maybe skip to save some time, but you can check it from, I will put this to the YouTube later. So, a bit also background, the economic situation in Finland is not very good. This is the GDP growth per capita for the last uh, 50 years. And as you can see, Finland has still didn't recover from the Euroshock, the highest peak of standard of, of the GDP per capita was uh, in 2008. So basically last 16 years has more or less been stagnation. Uh, the Nokia collapse was pretty he heavy because, because it happened quite fast, just in a few years. Nokia lost pretty much all of the market share. I, I think in the peak it was something like 4 or 5%, maybe even about the Finnish GDP, just for the Nokia production. Also traditionally Finnish economy has been highly dependent on the forest sector, but uh, this has been in steady decline, obviously, because people are just spending less and less paper, which is kind of good, but is causing some problems. This is kind of a second wave of the industrialization of some kind of manufacturing things. They're just disappearing and moving to China. Finland was actually pretty much benefiting from this first wave of the industrialization because Finland, there was never much like a heavy industry or a steel production. Almost no car manufacturing, so all of this stuff that started to move to Japan or China in the 80s or 90s, it didn't touch much Finland, but this second way is 
is uh, pretty bad. Then also, Finland traditionally was not the country of receiving migrants, but sending migrants originally to the United States, then uh, pretty much to Sweden. I think it was almost 10% of population, or maybe something like 6 or 8% of population we left to Sweden in the 60s and 70s. So Finland was more dependent on Russian trade than most of the countries in Europe. It was like 5% of the exports. Uh, I think in, in Europe only Lithuania and Latvia were more dependent. Then uh, also there was uh, energy crisis like in most of the EU countries, but it was less than Germany because Finland was less dependent on Russia energy sources. But this is all basically stacking this five or six different crises more or less happening at the same time. It's is basically setting this kind of political mood and landscape. So then we go to the elections last year. This the problem is that this map is from two these diagrams are from two different places so they have different color codes for the right wing populists. The small map is the 2019 elections, the bigger one is 2023 elections. And in the left map, the right wing populists, they are with the sky blue color, but here they are in the yellow. So you can see that basically in the bigger cities, the bigger cities, the coalition party is dominant, except there are a couple of red cities like Tampere, where social democrats are strong. And social democrats are generally strong in this kind of smaller industrial places. The coastline is dominated by the Swedish-speaking party and the peripheric places by the agrarian and the center party. And here is basically a amount of deputies. So the coalition party, Christians and, and uh, populist party, they are almost enough to have a, have a majority, but they still need the Swedish party, which is in the middle. And uh, this is... Why the Swedish party went to the government is a good question because they are pretty liberal and they are basically the only party they traditionally don't get along with is the populist party because populist party is also against Swedish language interests. They want to cut it uh, from the governance and from the education and so on. Right now the Swedish language is actually obligatory in Finnish schools because it's another official language which is quite unpopular because most of the Finland doesn't have much Swedish speakers. So, but basically, yeah, by going to government, the Swedish party guaranteed that there will not be any change in the official status of the Swedish language. And uh, they are also have been pretty much in all the governments for the last 50 years, because they are pretty f flexible on about pretty much any other questions. So, there are the parties, yeah, I, did, I forgot to put which parties are in the government, but so they are mostly, yeah, the right-wing populists, coalition, the Swedish party, and the Christian fundamentalists. So they have, I can get back maybe to this. So they have bit something like 110 majority, so it's been kind of slight majority in the parliament, but it's enough. If, but they need all, basically all the parties. I mean, they maybe could get rid of the Christian fundamentalists. They, they just have five deputies there, but, but uh, yeah. But yeah, so what's the policy? So basically the thing is that the coalition parties say to right-wing populists that, okay, you can fuck up the migrants and uh, we can fuck up the trade unions. And this is how we can get along. They actually managed to insist, the coalition parties managed to insist that there will not be any much of worsening of the environmental stuff. They made uh, some re relaxation on the fuel or something like this, so you can now put a bit less of renewables to the, to the gasoline, but that was pretty much it. The environmental program is still there. From the previous governments, they still try to get to carbon neutral in 2035. This will not happen, obviously, but, uh, but not much environmental politics have been cancelled. They did the tax cuts last year, which were mostly benefiting the rich. 
there has been cuts in all the sector except the defense, and also there is lots of like some uh, various anti-migrant policy politics. They are, um, for example, to get the citizenship, you have to reside eight years instead of five. Also, they start to deport people already after three months of, of unemployment. It's actually not so much that the right-wing populists can do in this respect, because lots of this stuff is actually regulated by the EU directives, and they are not kind of... This just not a habit in Finland to do something in contrary with the directives. There is also lots of attacks against the trade unions, but this I will discuss a bit later. Then the first scandal was uh, Wilhelm Junnila is one of, it was discussed as might be the most uh, shortest serving minister because he resigned after 11 days. Then they found out that in 1945 there was one minister who was even shorter time. But yeah, this is just stuff from his Facebook. There is like he's sending in local politician in Turku like happy beer taste birthday. Here is his election sticker in uh, in Turku. It says more gas bumper sticker. Here is is a snow woman he made to his yard or stuff like this. Basically, it's kind of image board guy. Here is making a speech. In Turku, it was a memorial demonstration. There was a terrorist attack in 2017 where two persons were stabbed to death and Nazis organized, used to organize annual demonstration of putting flowers to the river. It collapsed this year, so this year they stopped organizing it. But Junila was making a talk there. So this was even too much in Finland, like Finland is not Germany. In Finland, you can have a Nazi jokes and get pretty far. You can get as far as being a member of parliament, but uh, it's too much of getting a minister. So he had to resign, apparently, but uh, what the Populist Party made that they named just another guy who is basically just doing this, has been doing the same stuff, and who was actually former member of the coalition party, but he had was kicked out from the party for some harassing, some underage, underage girls in the party structure, so he joined um, the right-wing populist party and now he's minister of the foreign trade. So, which is also like specifics that traditionally the parties, they are picking their ministers themselves. So other parties don't infer, infer that much. But there was a big wave of anti-racist, uh, this was of course big, lots of outcry. There was a big um, wave of anti-racist protests last year in the summertime. Nine. I don't know what's... I think maybe, is it rubbing uh, against the plug in your pocket? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can... Out the receiver or the transmitter from the pocket a bit. Yeah, maybe I will... Or clip it on a belt if you have one. I had to put it to my hands, yeah. Try to put it here, yeah. Okay, yeah, so there was big like a uh, outcry of anti-racist actions. There was first 10,000 person demonstration in the summertime, which is quite unusual. I don't think it ever really happened that in the middle of the holiday season you could mobilize 10,000 people and then in the 3rd of September a major anti-racist demonstration in Helsinki. Uh, and what happened is that actually, yeah, anarchists made their, we wanted to make like anti-cuts statement. It is kind of banner, if you cut something, let's cut the head from the Petteri Enrico, Petteri is the prime minister. And um, Rico Pura is the chairperson of the right-wing populist party and minister of the finance. This was actually caused, it's a funny thing because this is kind of traditional meme, it actually, I don't know if people remember, there used to be a class war federation in the UK. In the 80s, they made about Thatcher, this kind of thing. In Finland, every 10 years, anarchist made this thing and it's a big scandal. And then it's forgotten. But this, now it was today's discussion in the national media, which basically was also completely sidelining all this anti-racist discussion, which basically uh, we didn't even want to discuss this anymore because it was so ridiculous. But, uh, but yeah, they were kind of, it was a successful counter media operation by our op opponents, just uh, which of, of course we were part partly guilty. But uh, I don't know, this kind of things happens. 
But what's the biggest problem like this demonstration? And we, the, we didn't agree this banner with the organizers and uh, we wanted to put some anti-austerity agenda also to these anti-racist um, mobilizations. But nothing like came out of this. There was no much continuation of this big anti-racist mobilization. Also, there was not any convergence of struggles. No, any anti-austerity agenda came up. This anti-racist discussion, this demonstration was big uh, mobilization was organized by some liberals of various kind of music production, industry, sports, and so on. People who don't have much of personal interest of struggling against austerity. And uh, this kind of two areas don't really meet. Like, and uh, probably it might be like different people coming, segments of people coming to anti-racist thing and anti-austerity thing. Uh, we didn't manage to somehow unite these struggles. And also these uh, demonstrations didn't have any discussion about this anti-union reforms, which I will talk later. Uh, then there was attempt basically quite soon after this, so basically in the same time we had attempt of uh, like radical left coalition. It was called Napi Tilti Hands Off, organized during the budget negotiations, where the coming up austerity measures were being discussed. Uh, so there were like four demands against all the cuts, uh, defense for the right to strike, end of the exploitation of the nature, and also that asylum is a right that uh, should be defended. Uh, there were like four main groups in the coalition. Arlyhma is the anarchist group in Helsinki. It's the group in which I'm presenting. It's basically a kind of common anarchist group. The main uh, aspect is that it's open, so everyone can join. Join uh, in most of the activities immediately, and uh, also, yeah, it has many working groups now, it's more of functioning like a federation of different directions. Aurora is another group in Helsinki, it's more kind of autonomous, autonomous communists, inspired by the Central Europe and, and French Antifa groups. It's been around uh, for two years. Uh, then, uh, this is in alphabetic order, just these groups. And Emilia, it's another autonomous group in Helsinki. They have more interest of uh, everyday struggles. Of, uh, For example, they now organize against rising the price of the public transport in Helsinki. It's maybe, yeah, maybe some inspiration of the Italian 70s and stuff like that. And then biggest is the Extinction Rebellion, it's in Finland, it's in the name of Elokapina. It was established almost in the same time as the British group, so it it's was connected. And the Extinction Rebellion is actually right now quite a hegemonic group in the Finnish extra-parliamentary left. They are the only group that can mobilize easily just their own supporters, like 500 or 1,000 people to something, and of course this is, is defining the tone of many things, that if you want to have a big kind of extra parliamentary mobilization, it's quite important to have them involved, but of course it's also kind of specific environmentalist group that is, has their own relatively narrow agenda, so it was actually quite a good thing that they, we managed to get them to this anti-austerity struggle but uh, also, I think for their own membership, they were not like so super enthusiastic and didn't maybe consider it the priority. But anyway, so, but yeah, this demonstration of 19th of September, it was not eventually really a success. I don't know exactly why, there might be some different factors. Uh, it was maybe not exactly good timing. The message of the tactics was a bit um, inconsistent because there were kind of lots of talking that we will blockade the government and so on, but in the event it was more or less a normal demonstration with some street blockades of a couple of hours. Also, it was really bad weather. Also, might be that it's not... We didn't really manage... Or we could have maybe reached out for some groups outside of the radical left or something, but yeah, for some reason it was not 
big success, except that in the same time there was a start of wave of university occupations, which was the biggest in the Finnish history. They were all the basically all the major universities were occupied in 16, uh, 16 different higher education institutions, at least 10 high schools and trade schools. But uh, what makes made these occupations a bit more, uh, more kind of straightforward is that actually often administration was supporting it because the university administration usually was also not super enthusiastic about these uh, austerity and cuts. But there was this protest movement, this one which didn't have any achievements at all. Basically, students are a group which apparently somehow, how, somehow the government is not much afraid of the students, but they were also not like generalization of the struggle, like students were, we tried to argue or that students should also have some more general demands and not just specific to the education cuts or education benefit cuts, but this didn't succeed. These occupations lasted like two or three weeks. Just to mention about the Gaza Solidarity Movement, it's not really a topic of the discussion, but it's existing and it has been like very, had much of endurance in Finland. There has been like relatively big actions on a weekly basis and in the wide geographic area also. Doesn't, hasn't changed the Finnish foreign policy. There is now lots of discussion in Finland about this new Finlandi Finlandisierung. I don't know if people in Germany remember this originally German term. This meant like lost of Finnish uh, independence of the foreign policy during the Cold War time because fin Finland was basically a capitalist country but it was in the socialist camp voting together with the Soviet Union in the United Nations. But, uh, but now it goes like opposite side that Finland basically is allied to the United States in interest and also Finland happened to just recently buy David Sling from Israel, which means that they tried to be quite careful in this commentary. But there are some, some uh, opposition even inside the right-wing parties about this current uh, kind of neutrality. But what is, is of course big factor that this Lots of the people who would otherwise probably be involved in the anti-austerity movement, they have been involved in the, in the Gaza Solidarity movement. So th this has shifted the focus since the October. Lots of the focus has shifted out from the domestic policy issues. Then uh, I go these different struggles, I go through of this bit like in a chronological order, or more or less. So in the December, there is traditionally Independence Day Thoughts March. It's a big uh, right-wing uh, march organized since 2014. It kind of positions itself as a political, patriotic event. But from the beginning, there has been uh, like pretty strong Nazi involvement. This is a picture maybe from 2017. There is a guy in the left has. Uh, as the Nordic resistance movement, SCAF, this was the biggest kind of international uh, Nazi movement in the Nordic countries, and they were like uh, full hardcore. They didn't even try to claim that they are something else. They had the stickers with Hitler and uh, this kind of stuff. But also like right-wing populists have been there. It's a bit like a cultural war also, that it's like, how, how, why cannot we just be marching with the torches? We don't have any agenda or demands and so on. Uh, so the biggest attendance of this torch, torch much was before COVID, maybe a bit less than 2000. And this has been basically annually main focus of the extra parliamentary left in Helsinki since around 2016. We always managed to outnumber the Nazis. The biggest attendance was maybe two, a bit less than 3000. And uh, this year, this is from the this year demonstration. This was actually first year that they were actually attempt. Well, actually, they, they were, there has been like attempts to blockade the fascists, but this year basically the gathering was in the Nazi gathering place. So the point was basically to expel Nazis from their own gathering spot. This is already after the cops cleared the area of the gathering. This is from the other side of the square after maybe around four hours of protesting. Uh, 
the, this year the coalition was Aaryhma, Aurora, then Varisverkasta is the main anti-fascist network in Finland. It's uh, called Hooded Crow Network. Hooded Crow, I don't know what this is in Germany, but it's this bird you can see in the, in the left. Uh, and then the left youth, the left uh, organization of, youth organization of the left party, and uh, Emilia. So yeah, it was maybe around one and, th one and a half thousand people managed to block the fascist gathering point. There were 40 people arrested, but uh, there were no much serious charges. There was not really like kind of, how to say, policy, how people should behave there in, in uh, face of the Nazis or the cops, but this general, um, general mood, I think, because of the Extinction Rebellion influence in the extra-parliamentary left is this kind of non-violent direct action, which means that no one was actually, no one got into serious confrontation, which has the limitation, but this, some limitation, but this time it worked out pretty well. The fascist attendance, it was, they had just a few hundred people because they had to wait two hours before they could start. Probably many of them went home. But also results of this continuous, continuous protest is that uh, this basically has become like, everyone knows that this is not like a political march of patriots, so the right-wing populists, they don't really come. Like visible member of parliaments or the leader of the party, they don't come to the march anymore which is also a kind of, of a victory. Then there were a bit the trade union struggles. There were lots of anti-labor reforms. This was basically one of the things that the right-wing parties could uh, have agreement. But these are not like a big reforms, but there are lots of them. For example, from now on, Unless there is, there is this term of general abiding contract, if there is big enough union negotiating a contract, even non-unionized workplaces have to follow it. But unless there is a general binding contract, there is first sick leave day should be unpaid. Also, first time it would be possible to make local contracts, which are worse than the contracts than the general binding. Would be also possible to sack individuals even without the serious uh, violations, even if they have a permanent program, contract. Finland actually the protection against layoff is and in all the Nordic countries, but uh, especially in Finland they have been traditionally pretty weak, but they are uh, trying to make it even more weaker. Also, there is, they want to establish this called export model, the idea that uh, basically no union could negotiate better wage increases than the ones in the export sector, which is especially hurting against the women in public sector, like health work and so on, because they usually have much worse wages, and now they couldn't even ask better wage increases, so they would always be have uh, wages that are behind. Then uh, there were limitations. Finland was actually the only country, at least in Europe, probably in the world, that uh, political strikes were completely allowed, even in the contract period. But uh, now they wanted to, they managed to limit this at maximum one day. And also before, uh, only unions could be fined for illegal striking. But uh, now there would be also some 200 euro fine for individuals. Also lots of, uh, lots of, cuts to unemployment benefits. Uh, I forgot to explain what is this serious cause. It was the name of the campaign, but it's Painavasu, so it doesn't also really translate because it means both, it's literally, it means heavy, but in this con context is, is uh, also serious. So what the unions managed to do, so they started with a wave of some symbolic short strikes and walkouts, and basically all the major unions were involved in this to some extent. But mostly the wage workers union, the SACO, was, which unionizes, it's the biggest central, centralized union structure, unionizes maybe 20% of the workforce. Altogether, the Finnish union, unionization right of the workforce is around 50%. But this depends a lot on the sector. And the biggest action was the port strike. It lasted one month. All the Finnish ports halted the, the work. And this was quite, is of course quite significant because if you look 
the map, the Finland only has a land border mostly with, uh, in Lapland and then with Russia. So basically economically, especially after the start of the Ukraine war, Finland is island, so port strike is halting all the foreign trade. And there were lots of discussion that this is complete disaster, lots of, uh, lots of the companies will go co completely bankrupt. But this is not what happened and apparently the employers were prepared of this. And unions were too afraid to call a general strike, which would, uh, would be the only possible escalation from this. I don't know exactly why, maybe they were, but the opinion polls, they were not exactly favorable. They were like slightly majority supporting the strikes, but there was not uh, any like, but of course general strike is also kind of a suicidal tactics. It always will cut, hurt workers more. So they were just a bit too afraid to go to this. They didn't manage to achieve much of this, except the export model law was changed a bit, so now it's a bit more vague. It might still be possible to give, have bigger wage increases in the health sector, but it's a bit uh, unclear. This dip will depend on the interpretation and so on. Sorry, I don't know all of this kind of union terminology even in English, but I think many of these things maybe are also concepts are maybe existing in Germany for some reason. But so anarchists, we of course then tried to criticize both the unions and attack the government and demanding a general strike. And this had uh, some impact. We managed to have the biggest ever May Day anarchist block in Helsinki. This says, let's look a general strike, now we have to do it. And lots of people who are not even anarchists, but more like left party supporters, they rather, or left youth supporters, they rather came to our block than went to their own blocks. But um, obviously it's just like 400 people doesn't change much. Anyway, you can just, so, and there are also the, these hands of coalition of the extra parliamentary left. It's, it uh, made some more actions and uh, they were like an unruly street party demonstration. It was actually quite ruly because people didn't, some uh, other groups in the coalition didn't want to have more confrontation. But then anarchists squatted this manor house, which is owned by the city of Helsinki. There are actually quite many of these former gentry houses in Helsinki which are empty because they are in such a bad condition that it's difficult to sell them. This was squatted maybe like one month in Melahti area and there has been a couple of squats uh, since then. So this, it's still existing. This, it's called Chaos Mansion, but now it's in another spot, but uh, still not evicted in the eastern side of Helsinki. And there was also like some anarchists started to do more direct actions. Uh, for example, against forest industry, also general go and the government, they were also like protest against the state broadcasting company connected with the Eurovision and also Helsinki University after it evicted the Palestinian solidarity camp. Uh, this still didn't result in so much police interests, probably because there was not like so much like like super much property damage this far. But uh, these direct actions, usually they are not related uh, to anti-austerity struggles, but maybe more to environmental or Gaza or stuff like this. Just, I'm almost finished, just a couple of more struggles. There was also the border between Finland and Russia has been completely closed since December because the asylum seekers started to come. There has actually been a kind of informal agreement between Finland and Russia since maybe 1991 that uh, Russia is basically controlling the Finnish border. If you go from fin Helsinki to St. Petersburg by bus, there is one controlling spot in the Finnish side, but there are four controls in the Russian side. So, and uh, lots of fans, lots of conscripts uh, guarding in the forests, but uh, obviously after NATO, but this was always a bit strange agreement. I didn't, never understood why Russia is doing this. And after now Finland was joining NATO, they were obviously not, didn't want to do it anymore. And they started even to mobilize some asylum seekers to come to Finland, which was created a huge hysteria that, okay, now maybe little green men are taking over our country. 
and the whole border was closed since December. It was supposed to be temporary for two weeks, but it's been almost a year and it's still closed. There was movement against this by, by Russian speakers in Finland. It's quite a big minority. It's actually the biggest minority language after the Swedish, is the Russian in Finland. Usually this community is not much interested in politics, but now it got organized. Uh, didn't get any results this far with the campaign. But uh, we didn't, like we are kind of also supporting this demand to open the borders. It's mostly just hurting in terms of like boycotting Russian war economy. It's quite pointless. It's mostly just hurting people who have relatives in the other side of the border. The visas have not been granted already for more than two years. So most of the people who were traveling, they were only, only people who had a Finnish res citizenship or permanent residence or visiting their relatives. But we didn't uh, like join this campaign or made any intervention because this uh, movement, they don't have like any position in the Ukrainian war, which is also meaning that they are, are not very popular in the Finnish society. And, um, and yeah, yes, you might guess that in Finland basically like 99% of people are supporting Ukraine. So it's just kind of, how to say, a bit, would be a bit strange to have a big uh, Russian minority movement which doesn't say anything about that. Even if, of course, like we don't think that it's, it's, uh, it's kind of responsibility if there is some Russian who has been living in Finland, maybe, probably, maybe born in Finland or lived there since was 10 years old. It's not their responsibility to stop the war in Ukraine. But still, uh, like politically, it's not possible not to even comment about this stuff. There was a campaign against the pushback law. This is, we go back to this, I mentioned in the beginning about this constitutional protections in Finland, which are pretty weak. Uh, Finland has, of course, maybe like Germany, it's obsession about legalism. So if you want to break the law, you have to do it legally. So the mechanism, not like in this kind of barbarian places like Lithuania or Poland, so they wanted to have this pushback mechanism legalized and they kind of admitted that, okay, this is anti-constitutional, but they can have like anti-constitutional laws with the majority of the five sixths. And they actually needed the support of the social democrats for this because, uh, because but also to, to turn this down, it would not be enough just to green and left party were against this. Finnish left party, they don't have any anti-migrant wing, so they are basically more like Linke altogether. So, yeah, but they managed to get uh, from opposition to Centre Party and Social Democrats to, uh, to support this thing, but there were quite big uh, internal conflicts in the Social Democrat Party and even the two vice chairman, vice chairpersons of the Social Democrat Party, they were against this law. But the street, so they were kind of fighting kind of, how to say, the struggle was significant inside the parliament, but uh, it was, um, the street campaign was pretty weak. This is the groups that were like uh, endorsing the campaign. So most of these are pretty marginal, except maybe the Amnesty International. The, there was just one demonstration, which was pretty kind of Apathic. So it's a bit like a problem, like these two groups, like uh, or illegal migrants, asylum seekers, and then also people who are uh, receiving social benefits. They are not very organized in the society, like trade unions and wage earners, they are much more capable to defend themselves. But there is not really kind of, it's not kind of constituent of the society and this Finnish system. Like the German one is kind of cooperatist system. There is like there is employers have their thing, and then there are wage workers and small entrepreneurs. All of them they have their own association and uh, like dealing with stuff together. But then this group that are outside of this kind of cooperatist model, they are basically like free targets to all the kind of shit. Uh, but yeah, this law is only taking effect. It has to be activated in this situation that there is event of, of instrumentalized entrance that doesn't have, hasn't happened yet. So it's not activated. As long as it's not activated, it cannot go to the European Union court, as far as I know. So we don't know if EU, different European Union courts can actually cancel this law or not. 
now is just existing in the paper. But so, this cycle of struggles is now apparently winding down. Uh, the left party got massive uh, victory in the Euro parliamentary elections. They became the second biggest party and they got like every sixth vote. The chairman, this Lee, chairperson, the Lee Anderson, was more popular than I think the center party. Alone, she got alone like 9% of the votes. So it was a huge victory for the party and probably might mean that most of the people who are enthusiastic about party politics, they are just waiting for the next elections. From now, of course, the European parliamentary election is a bit specific, mostly only freaks are voting. The right-wing populists, they don't care about this uh, election, so it doesn't mean that this will be the results in the following elections, but it was a big uh, moral boost for all the people who are once mostly concentrating on the party politics stuff. Extinction Rebellion, they kind of drop out from our coalition. They organized their own campaign to have better cuts, to cut some, how to say, environmental harmful subsidies, which is, of course, like a super moderate goal, in my personal opinion, and, but probably with this government, even this will not have any chance to succeed. Trade unions kind of dropped this campaign, this uh, serious cause campaign, they are now concentrating more to get, there is a new round of negotiation happening now, and they are kind of ambitious to kind of have a revenge of this humiliation and to get better wage increases. Generally in Finland, the wage policy, wage increases have been uh, smaller than in other countries. I cannot see, but I know that I should maybe start the discussion. Uh, but yeah, so some questions like, so how is it possible to have a struggles in the condition of uh, economic stagnation and decline? And how to also, how to interview or support the trade union struggles when the trade unions basically always are hating when anarchists are trying to make some intervention and uh, just asking us to go home. And uh, then also how to organize people be, who are in the social benefits because the government didn't really do much shit to people who are working. Of course, there was this thing of the first day sick leave, for example, but this probably 95% of the people have, who are working, they have contracts which have a kind of paid sick leave from the beginning. Also, how to unite anti-racist and social struggles and stop this kind of fragmentation of the movement. Besides these actions which I was listing, there were like other campaigns and struggles. Basically, there were demonstrations every week, and which means that uh, probably like people stop going to demonstration if there is one, one or two every week. And also, is it really like job of anarchists to try to create this kind of coalitions? Or should it be which we kind of try to do to some extent? Or should anarchists more like try to push discussion to more radical directions to have more space for more moderate groups and actions? Or whatever, if, if you want to ask something else. Apparently it was extended at the last minute. And I didn't know about it until now. Yeah. So, yeah. Do we have questions? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask if there's, with the situation on the border to Russia, if there's some kind of on the ground organization the way that happens in Lithuania and Poland. Uh, I didn't hear everything, but like there is no currently, there is almost no refugees coming. Like there is, has been uh, maybe month, maybe one case a month that there is some group that is stopping the border, but there is not this kind of attempts to bypass, bypass the thing. Like this border is not a traditionally, doesn't have like illegal migration in the eastern Finnish border has not been a tradition. It's not a, like migrant route. There is no existing uh, organizations doing this. And what was before the border closure, it was basically Russian authorities were organizing 
people to come to the border crossing points to ask for asylum, but not through the forest. It was probably the plan was to create in the long run a kind of migration route so that the Russian authorities don't need to do this anymore, so that there is, would be like a continuous pressure. But this didn't happen. It might be, of course, that at some point there is this uh, kind of migration roads are being developed, but you need to have a people who more or less know the routes and places and so on. And maybe there is, it doesn't seem that there is like a real attempts or interest to Russia now to encourage this kind of business. So there is basically yeah, not, people are not coming through the forest at this point. Yeah. I have one possible answer and a question. Um, my answer to the how to organize people on social benefits. So um, here within the territory that is currently occupied by Germany, um, even the FAU, like the anarchist union, the syndicalists, they have a sub-chapter in certain cities for people that are on social benefits. And they mostly consist on meetings for self-help, um, dealing with the bureaucracy, dealing with rent trouble and so on. And um, this has proven like a, a very great deal in community organizing and also like, yeah, getting into a more politicized discussion about social benefits, mm. maybe to look into that. And the question was, um, how are the, like, how do you connect to, or do you know about or work together with the struggles of the Sami people in Northern Finland? Yeah, this is, uh Sami struggle is something that has been going on on this, and we have uh, organized some, or, or like extra parliamentary left, they have some connection with the Sami, Sami, and organizing some things. Of course, thing is that some stuff is happening on the ground. It's pretty far. It's like there used to be, I think, maybe two or three years ago, there was a summer summer uh, protest camp on the fishing issues, but there is the geographical distance. There is some community also in, uh, in the capital area. But one thing is that lots of the most active uh, Sami people there are aff affiliated with the Green Party because, because all this um, more, tra because they are kind of hoping that they need uh, some support in the parliamentary side, parliament side also. And all the traditional parties in the north, even the left party, there are anti-Sami. So Green Party is kind of party which doesn't have like traditional support in the north. So this is why they want try to align it with. And Green Party has some other like new support base also in, in the Lapland. But uh, Sami actually, there is like biggest struggle with the Sami for the last maybe 10 years has been the ISO, in the, like uh, United Nations ISO Treaty, which is giving some, some kind of special rights to use about the, the resources and so on. And it doesn't really like change so much actually, but uh, the, there is like very heavy anti-Sami sentiment in the North and lots of racism and suspicion that they want to take over some sort of, for example, rending herding, which is traditionally also doing, done much in the north by the Finnish people. So, but now it's, there are some chances that this is moving forward and also even bigger conflict actually has been, or actually maybe the ISO thing is, sorry, I was confused. Uh, ISO, ISO treaty might, might be that it's not proceeding, but another thing is the Sami election law because there has been lots of conflicts on who would actually be eligible to vote in the Sami parliament elections. Because now there, is, there are things in people in the north who maybe have one Sami ancestor in the 18th century, but for 20 or 30 years they were basically anti-Sami activists. But now because they kind of didn't manage to do what they want in the anti-Sami activism, they decided that okay, now we are Sami people because we have one ancestor maybe eight generations ago, so they want to infiltrate the Sami community. And this was a big uh, struggle to kind of kick these people out, but now there is kind of, kind of, of agreement that uh, they, even, even with, they managed to get even the right-wing party because they were also right-wing parties to agree of changing the election law so that the Sami community could actually 
actually choose who is actually a member of the community. So this is something that they have been surprisingly enough in the successful, even with this kind of right-wing government situation. Do you want to respond to the thing about welfare? Ah, the welfare, yeah, it's, yeah, it's true. It's the only thing, problem is that what Finnish government did already in the 90s, that uh, they organized, when there was a huge, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a huge economic crisis, the unemployment was up to 25%. And there was also lots of kind of unemployment organization, but most of these organizations, they got corrupted already in the 90s. So that they basically just started to channel some state funds and uh, just involved in this kind of uh, em supported employment business that they get some unemployed people to do just some, fix some dishwashing machines or sell some used electricity, this kind of, basically this kind of thing. But because Finland has this uh, cooperatist, co cooperatist uh, idea is that, okay, there is one organization for workers, one organization for environment, one organization for Sami people, one organization for unemployed, unemployed. So this corrupted unemployed organization is kind of taking this area. But of course there could be... Of course, it's possible if you do some very active organization, it would be possible to kind of, how to say, replace these corrupted unemployed organizations and to create real ones. But uh, it would be lots of work for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question uh, regarding political violence. You mentioned that Extin Extinction Rebellion uh, has the strategy of no violence, and you mentioned the uh, torch march. So are there any attacks from the right-wing party or any members? How is the situation with violence? Uh, they are also like, I think, well, like funny thing, I think the general, the, it's, of course, a big topic. I've been thinking about this. To me, it seems like I'm already 45 years old. To me, it seems that it's not only like in this radical left politics, but it's in the general in the society. The violence, amount of violence is falling, and it also influences the right wing. That they are kind of real tough, but then when they come and try to attack something, they are like just even if, if they are some teenagers, they go to gym or martial arts, but they are com completely clueless and they get beaten up. Like not really with the Extinction Rebellion, but if they come to anarchist events, it's always ends up pretty badly for them. So even the Nazis are kind of non-violent, even if they wouldn't like to be, like to be non-violent. Non so this is kind of thing, this is going going through the society as a whole, but of course it's a problem like now the right-wing populists, they are having the Minister of Interior, they are having the Secret Service. So if there is a situation that they actually start to behave like fascist, which they currently couldn't do because they only have like 40, like 20% of the seats in the parliament, so they cannot really like make a coup. But if there is a coup and fascist government, I don't know who would be able to resist it. So, but yeah, but basically, yeah, like I said, like fascists are also like now, of course, it's a, it's a bit, some changes in this, there is also this active club, which is kind of a TikTok or YouTube phenomena, but it's everywhere. They're also in Finland and uh, one of the guys now got some sentence for the violent crimes. There were also attempts, I think last couple of years in the Independence Day, they were active, club of members from Sweden and they were arrested with knives. So there is, and, uh, all, all, and there is also like one long time Nazi activist in, uh, in the middle, like Olu, which is in the north, made a Nazi attack and stabbing a 12 year old kid. And there were like two other, like one other fascist stabbing there and it might be that there was a third stabbing recently, but might, might be also fascist. So there is also this violence is happening. But it's mostly just this most unstable and crazy guys doing it. It's nothing like very organized or skillful or something. So I'm not like super. And there has been also, yeah, there, there has been occasionally cases of these Nazi terror groups. There was one group which was shooting with shotguns, some migrants, uh, postal box, another group which was having 40 kilos of dynamite. But none of this 
as this far being like very successful or something. But of course, this kind of thing is there. But there is not like some Nazis who could uh, organize some organized attack of 40 or 50 people against us. This is not going to happen anytime soon. Even this stuff that has been happening in the independent states been very badly organized and they were immediately arrested. Yeah. Um, some days ago we had a discussion also as part of the anarchist days uh, of some uh, anti-fascist groups and um, we were talking about strategies and many of those groups said, okay, what we should do more is to do some um, community organizing, for example, in neighborhoods. Um, also, there's an organize, yeah, there's organizing of the queer community here in Dresden, also the anarchist um, union, FAU, is based on uh, community organizing in a way. So. I'm interested in, do you also discuss um, this community um, organizing as a strategy or are there other strategies you are discussing? Because I can, like, there were certain points where you said, okay, this attempt it didn't work, like there was no success and I'm just interested in the state of discussion when it comes to strategies. I think, yeah, there is is uh, attempt to, I mean, do you mean to organize with wider community and neighborhoods and this kind of thing? I think there is basically people have some understanding that this is necessary and especially if you have a squad, it's quite important that it's kind of tolerated and respected in the neighborhood. So you have to have a relations. But also there is, is like lack of proper space in Helsinki even that there is not really, like there are problems even uh, to have a kind of anarchist community, to have a place for the anarchists to hang, which is like a suitable, suitable, like one of the problem with this squatted house is that they are often in such a bad condition that after a couple of months everyone is having asthma and have to, have to find some, some other place and maybe to go to the doctor and so on. So yeah, basically yeah, there is I think people kind of understand this, but there is still uh, some steps that has to have to be taken even to get to kind of this level to have a possibility to meaningfully engage with the community. Yeah. Can do. But also, yeah, I, say, I think in general, like not maybe so much in the anarchist, which is pretty small fraction, but of course there is kind of opposite tendency in the activists that lots of things go to social media and uh, which is kind of anonymous and atomized way of communication. And we also sometimes we have 20,000 people liking or not maybe liking, but at least we, they see what we do in some social media. But do we see these people in any other place ever? Probably not. Yeah. So who wants to have the honor of the final question? Since I'm not seeing any hands, that was the final question. Let's give another round of applause to our speaker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, thanks for this. But yeah, I will be around here today. Unfortunately, not tomorrow. So if people have some questions or comments or want to know something, you can always come and ask. But yeah, thanks for coming.